let's look at how to come up with storytelling for a given problem absolutely let me tell you a story and then let's see how this can work let me give you a story in the entire business value chain in the area of warehousing with a particular organization which is not a warehousing organization but they have their own warehouse and this is the warehouse for both inbound and outbound uh, aspect of the supply chain what was the problem the complex problem that we were dealing with there was that the capacity of the warehouse was completely choked and why was the capacity of the warehouse completely choked because the turnaround of inventory was not really happening the way it was envisaged and that would start creating a lot of problems in terms of accidents in terms of damages in terms of identifying where they have kept what so once upon a time is a great way to start off storytelling so professor kavita once upon a time if that's the first sentence with which we can start that's done so once upon a time i was working with a company where warehousing was an issue so we got together and we did not redesign the warehouse what we actually did was they could identify certain areas in the warehouse which could be cleared and those areas could be used for additional uh, things that could be stopped and they not only cut the cost of warehousing <clears throat> but they optimized warehousing solution and they also <clears throat> made it absolutely agile in its own way and finally they also tweaked the warehouse over a period of time so that it would suit the assembly line that's the way stories are built stories are real time so two things you can do madam one you can build your own stories or with the industry academicia interface and if you're doing a lot of uh, design thinking projects with academics with industry those can be amazing stories that can be built but i'll tell you what there's another thing you could do you can ask your students to get on and yes stories can be case studies absolutely i was getting to that you can ask your students to research design thinking organizations build a repository of case studies which you can administer in your college also. Please participate in it. Build some, I think your first batch should be a batch where you're building good case studies. And once you've got those case studies, you're done. Also expert conversations on design thinking, their stories, something that will work for sure. Absolutely. So stories is, and case study based stories is absolutely good. Theme based shared model, can you elaborate it, sir? Okay. Uh, can you just tell me what was it about team based shared model, uh, Professor Vijay? Can you just give me a context, please, so that I can take it uh, on that context? I'm not able to recollect what I spoke on that. Uh, my apologies. So please explicitly tell me what is it that you want on that. But as far as I know, team based shared model is uh, the new business value chain that is emerging in the 21st century is going to operate on team designs that means leaders will have to design their teams for success which is again a design thinking problem and they will also have to operate on a shared leadership model where all the digital nomads and the intellectual partners they will all have to work together so it's a shared collaboration under which the business value chains will now operate they're not they're not restricted only within the organization <clears throat> but they're also going to operate with external partners extensively and these partners are not going to be vendors but they're going to be actually contractual partners that work with the organization let's understand how else can you now teach this whole concept of value chain uh, to students i mean shared model in team based design given topic in module one okay shared model in team based design in this in given in this topic so the the, the shared model in team based design is typically like this there are two dimensions to it uh, professor vijay like i was saying uh, when i was discussing the value chain the first dimension is that you pick up different people from different functions to bring in diversity you create a, a team 
in the design thinking process and then you do design thinking that becomes a team based model in design thinking you don't restrict yourself only to the internal teams of that particular function you don't do that number 2 which is the shared model in the team based design would be in design thinking would be you are picking up a complex organizational issue it is a model that is shared by multiple teams once the prototype is created because the prototype is now impacting across the organization so it's then it becomes a shared model which is team based all the teams are coming in and creating a prototype where parts or the whole of the prototype is going to impact everybody give giving me a giving you a, a, a typical story on this performance management system was taken up as one of the design thinking problems in an organization now how did it become a team based design it became a team based design because traditionally performance management system is controlled only by the human resource department but they decided to use design thinking and therefore they brought in people from various value functions they came in and they worked on the design thinking problem of ensuring that performance management system becomes easy to administer and fast to deliver its results so people from different departments were brought in they worked on it and why does it come up as a shared model in team based design it came up as a shared model in team based design because that particular model of performance management was impacting all the teams in the organization because performance management was impacting all the teams that's the way the shared model would operate in team based design you pick up a prototype that is shared by every, is is it is complex problem divided into simple problems with team working on them sharing with one another later to consolidate to reach a goal am i approaching the concept to an extent dr anupama patel you're right to an extent but can you extend it further by saying it is a complex problem divided into simpler problems yes on a root cause analysis you decide you you definitely bring it into smaller problems with teams working on them no all the teams work on all the problems sharing with one another later to consolidate no madam don't do that in design thinking at all that is a typical traditional business process i'm so glad dr anupama patel you came up with this question thank you so much for this question i think this value adds to everybody here everybody works on every problem together there is no concept of later consolidation the prototype is completely integrated if you were to get into later consolidation you will definitely have a lot of noise coming into the prototype for sure thank you dr anupam patel that's thank you for your confirmation what else can you do to teach design thinking one is case studies can be built second presentations are normal hence it is a non linear and dynamic absolutely it's absolutely non linear and dynamic the moment the process becomes linear it is absolutely a process which is uh, driven by a business process constructing a tower using balloons can be a good idea well dr ramesh hegde i leave that to you you are an engineer i think i have left engineering a long time back though i do consult in the area of design thinking but the engineer in me has become a psychologist and a management consultant now i leave that choice to you in terms of how you would go about it but yes it can qualify as a design thinking problem for sure i wonder i mean when i visited egypt and when i went to the pyramids at the giza and when i looked at how tall the pyramids of giza were the first thing that struck me was without the cranes how did they build those pyramids possibly uh, they could think about complex problems and simple solutions and that's how they managed it that's the analogy that i can have dr ramesh ekde for this but a very interesting questions that you posed a very interesting idea uh design thinking a lot of content is also available on the internet uh e learning programs are available uh, but uh, we also have e learning programs and you can use those also harvard has some amazing programs uh, mit sloan has some amazing programs coursera has some amazing programs on design thinking there are various places where design thinking programs are available in fact it's going to be market is going to really heat up uh and they're going to be wanting a design thinking so i think academic institutions like yours you should also devote time in creating content so the content is available for the students within and also the people outside 
Coming back to our topic on uh, the uh, value chain, I think it's important to build stories at each part of the value chain. And while we build stories at each part of the value chain, I think we'll be able to teach design thinking very effectively. To summarize the entire session, the first session that we went through, let me now bring the whole thing into a perspective and then we will have Satish coming in and we will have a conversation around the uh, area of supply chain and logistics. So let's look at this. A supply chain, uh, uh, sorry, a business value chain typically starts with, if we were to do systemic thinking, starts with the raw material coming in that's the first department so we're dealing with departments we're dealing with functions that's the first one inbound you can have purchase as a part of it you can have the uh, in warehouse also a part of it so everything to do with inbound is there then you have operations so how is the material moving or how is the process within the organization moving how is the chain within the organization moving from the material coming in it goes into operations. Operations does the transformation of the material, which is what operations is all about, right? Input and output, you transform the raw material into a finished good. Then it moves into outbound. That means it's moving to warehouse and a dispatch again. Let's look at a scenario like chocolates. So I visited a chocolate factory and I was looking at how the value chain operates. A beautiful chocolate factory in Switzerland then amazing experience the end of it is the best they let you eat a lot of chocolates but they don't tell you that the best of the chocolates are in the end so the whole idea that i learned in that entire process was don't eat too many chocolates in the beginning so the chocolate the raw chocolate comes in and in the inbound process there is the there are the farmers which send the seeds to the plant there are people there who sort the seeds in terms of the quality that comes into the process of operations where the actual chocolate is being made a beautiful process, a clear systematic process, precision in terms of temperature control, in terms of time, all that put together. Once the chocolate is made and it moves into the outbound process, it's a very interesting design thinking problem that I was dealing with a warehouse in India. The people visiting the warehouse would eat away the chocolate. So the theft of chocolate was not happening. The theft was not happening. Nobody was stealing the chocolate. People were getting into the cold storage and it was a massive warehouse where God alone knows how many chocolates were being stored. You just pick up a chocolate and eat it. A classic design thinking problem. Some small carton somewhere ready to be shipped and one little chocolate vanishes from there. The warehouse folks got to know about it, picked it up as a design thinking problem, fixed it. So that particular problem in the, in the value chain was actually creating a problem, not at the raw material stage, not at the inbound stage, not at the operation stage, but across the cycle after that, the marketing, lots of complaints coming back. So that's, that's another place. And then the material moves into the retail chain outside. Now, this is a massive design thinking area. In fact, designing retail chains and engineers are required in it because there is so much of engineering that goes. In warehouse, there is materials equipment that's happening. There is this whole idea of scientific way, way of building a warehouse. But retails typically require systemic thinking and engineering colleges teach us to think in a very systematic way. You can map the process, you can get, you can sort, start sorting a lot of issues that come up in retail. Now, one of the biggest issues coming up in retail today is people visit the retail store, but buy online. And therefore the retailers are also having a problem. Or the other is the capacity that the retail store should maintain. That's another design thinking problem. And then the end customer, the service part of it, where while the customer is uh, is taking our product and using our product how do we retain that customer how do we build customer advocacy and i think in the business value chain customer advocacy if there is an example it's apple apple has created such an such a strong ecosystem that to get out of that ecosystem itself is a problem for anybody you have an apple book a laptop you have uh, the iPhone, you have the iPad, Apple Pad, 
you have music on the cloud, you have apps on the cloud, you have your storage on iCloud. There's so many things happening. And over a period of time, you don't realize that you've actually got into the entire process and you are contained in the process. You cannot move out of that ecosystem at all. A fascinating design thinking area in the value chain. And then to support this entire primary chain that we're talking about through these different stories, obviously you need people who are able to get your inbound vendors in place. Some vendors shut shop, some vendors upgrade, some are very monopolistic, authoritative vendors and they start dominating. So building other set of vendors, transfer of technology, all that becomes a complex design thinking problem. Human resource, like I said, the biggest life cycle management is how do you manage high maintenance employees? And when I say high maintenance employees, these are employees who are earning a lot of salary, lot of experience, lot of knowledge, can do a lot of stuff, but decide not to do it. Or maybe team dynamics, or maybe designing of the teams, all that becomes an area for HR. And then technology and infrastructure, obviously, we also talked about post pandemic scenario where the infrastructure is also now undergoing change. And I think architecture, civil engineering, plays a lot of role in terms of optimizing offices now and creating layouts which will be ready for the future because intelligent buildings are the future. So across the value chain now, design thinking certainly operates. It's 11.58. Uh, let's have Satish coming in. So Satish, you can start preparing to enter the conversation now. We've got another two more minutes to go. Uh, my last inputs to you on the value chain, value chain analysis and value chain in design thinking best learned through case studies best learned through stories that's the way it goes for sure so let's see if satish is able to enter now so satish are you entering are you there yes we can i'm there fantastic can we have your camera on please yeah it's camera. lovely thank you for joining in satish let me introduce satish to all of you satish looks after the entire operations of atyasa he's the president of atyasa he also looks after the entire e-learning aspect of Atyasa and Satish also coordinates with a lot of educational institutions and is a speaker on a lot of channels also comes with a very rich experience. Uh, we were fortunate to be colleagues together in an education uh, company uh, and that's when we became friends and the friendship is now 20 years old, possibly more than that. And now we're colleagues working together as brothers in arms and, you know, ensuring that the organization of ours does well. Satish comes with a very strong background in supply chain. And as we move into the understanding of supply chain, and because Satish is also doing a lot of work around design thinking, let me allow me to interview Satish for you. And I think uh, there will be a lot of rich things that you will take end of the session for sure. So Satish, two things we'll talk about. Sure. We will talk about migrating from business value chains into supply chains. Yeah. So to help people understand what's the difference between a value chain and a supply chain, a value chain typically are a set of functions which create value within the organization, which means they create systems, processes, outcomes, which ultimately generate margins for the organization. Whereas the supply chain is an operative process of the organization where the raw material, the information and the money flows. It's a systematic process of ensuring the material coming in to the supplier, to the end customer and the customer's customer getting serviced. That's the whole idea of supply chain that we will discuss. And as we move into the afternoon session, obviously we will explore the whole idea of supply chain and how design thinking works there. So Satish, uh, the first thing, would you like to give an insight into what you've done in your life and what is your corporate experience so that people can start triggering their questions based on that? Sure, Nikkei. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure to have been associated with uh, this group here with the VTU, uh, the second batch that we are undergoing on the introduction of innovation uh, and design thinking, the most relevant skills in, in the current century, uh, most in demand at the same time, very, very practical for all sorts of businesses, startups, small, medium existing businesses, large organizations, and last but not the least, educational institutions as well. And I'm glad most of the faculties and the uh, participants came out with questions. How does design thinking help educational institutions in enhancing admissions, in enhancing interaction with corporates? 
very, very relevant, extremely important, and that's what the NAP 2020 wants to deliver, an industry institution partnership in delivering skills that match that industries want through the educational system. Excellent idea. We need to all go join hands together to make it fruitful. My background is about 30 years plus experience in the corporate world. I came from uh, a science background. I did my MBA in marketing, and then I've been working in the corporate world for 30 plus years. I've been in sales. I've been in operations. I've been in the business planning team for the, of the organization. That is, how do we take the organization to the next level? building the supply chain, reinforcing the supply chain, strengthening it so that the value can be delivered to the organization as well as the consumers of the services that we were providing. Out of the 30 plus years, I've spent 17 years in the supply chain and that in the international supply chain, uh, earning dollars for the country, at the same time helping the exporter and importer community to uh, shrink the world and make the globe as their marketplace while they source as well as sell the goods. Uh, I bring that along with me a lot of experience working with diverse people, diverse organizations, diverse consumers and customers who kept demanding uh, better value, better service, better rates, value for money. And uh, they always wanted us to be on our toes to bring value to their organization, to the business and see how we as Indian marketers, as Indian manufacturing organizations can dominate in the European and American, uh, which is a largely consumer-based market for all sorts of goods, be it high-tech, be it engineering, be it automotive, be it retail and, and garments or jewelry, for that matter. That's what India law largely exports. So I bring that kind of an experience, Naked, which I'm sure I'll be able to relate to it in the next 30 minutes of discussion in our Certainly. Certainly. Thank you, Satish. Let's look at the first part. As a person who was supporting companies, in terms of the inbound logistics as a part of not supply chain, but now as a part of the value. Yeah. All right. Now in the value system, in the value chain of an organization, theory of constraints says that the weakest link of the chain defines how strong the chain is. Absolutely. Right. Now in the inbound process, which is the raw material coming in, the purchase guys, the inbound warehouse, which exists, the inbound logistics that exists, where do you felt that the value of that particular function starts diminishing. Uh, are you saying the purchasing function or the procurement function? Yes, I'm talking about the procurement function, the purchasing function, even the logistics company, which is picking up the raw material and transporting it in to the factory. I'm talking about that particular cluster there. Where does the value get lost, both at the transporter's end and at the company end? Uh, the value actually gets lost in not getting the supplier prepared very well okay. uh, on fulfilling the order or fulfilling the delivery timeline uh, of, a, of, an, of an importer. That means he's de delivering the product right or the raw material right. Yes. But he's goofing up in terms of the timelines or the way the product is being shipped, there could be damages in the way. Is that what you're saying? Yes, both the things. One is or the timeline for actually shipping and getting it delivered on time, as well as the compromise on packaging. Typically okay. what happens is everybody's trying to cut corners because the procurement is so cutthroat that they are selling the price at a very nominal value. The margins that the, the exporters in the overseas markets or even in Indian exporters make is not on the product of the, the value of the product, but on the value of the incentives the government gives. Yeah. The, the, the savings on the supply chain, the savings yeah. that could accrue because of uh, compromised packaging. And all that really leads to a, uh, uh, burning the bridges with the consumer because the customer does not expect the goods to come in a damaged form because it's, uh, it does not meet his his, his requirement. The, the damage again spills over into his ability to produce and supply to his customer. A re a reshipping is required. Custom duties are paid. So many things that really get wasted. Right. So that means the material coming in. I mean, a lot of times we look at material coming into the plant just as material coming into the plant. Yes. So it's way beyond that, right? Yes, absolutely. It's way beyond that. Yes. What happens in the warehouse? 
when the raw material comes in, what all can go wrong in the warehouse? Well, there are systems in the uh, in the use today for, for several years. Most companies try to beat the system by physically taking the goods into the warehouse, inspecting it, putting them on the shelf, but not updating the ERP package, saying this oh. good has been arrived. So what happens? The visibility is there only to the store inward inbound stores. They know that this model has come. How does the production person come to know? How does the uh, the internal supply chain team come to know about this material being available? Because there is uh, there is a certain timeline by which the product needs to be used to ship the finished good out to their own customer. But if it lies on the shelf for 48 hours without visibility to anybody, then you lost 48 hours and you could probably be penalized by the buyer in, in thousands of dollars because you delayed it, uh, delayed the delivery. I think in the first seven minutes, a message that is coming loud and clear for all our participants here is the systems and the processes are created absolutely correctly. Absolutely. But deviations tend to happen. Yeah. And they are complex human centric problems because it may be a function of competence. It may be a function of discipline. It may be a function of multiple people working together. True. That means defining a process, defining a system, bringing technology in does not guarantee successful value creation in the organization. Am I right? True. Absolutely. All right. Now let's say the warehouse with whatever value it's creating, not creating, whatever is the raw material available moves into operations, moves into the factory. All right. And there's a noise that definitely gets generated in the factory. Or if you were to look at a service function, we don't talk about only manufacturing. Let's also talk about service function. In a service function, when the service delivery, which is the real operative process that's happening. And I want you to go back to your experience in the field of logistics and express logistics. When the operations actually gets kicking, where the companies that you work with are international class companies, they have absolute well-defined processes, all systems in place, and yet things go wrong. Can you explain to our participants what really happens? The whole thing that happens behind the stage, the, the drama looks perfect, the play looks perfect, but there are a lot of things going wrong backstage. Can we talk about that? Sure, certainly. So let me relate to, to you uh, what typically happens in a logistics. So a manufacturer gets the goods, manufactured, well in time, gives you the pay exports paperwork, gives you the shipment, and the shipment is at the transporters and or at the service provider's uh, warehouse. Now what happens? They are supposed to expedite the customs clearance, book the space uh, for the container at, a, uh, at the port on the particular vessel sailing on a specific date. You need to start working backwards. Okay. If the sailing is on a specific date, you need to book the space by that specific time. Otherwise, you don't get a confirmed space. It's a tentative space. If somebody doesn't show up only, then your container will be loaded. And then you won't need to work backwards. What are the goods? How much time will the customs need to clear the goods? There may be red flags that the customs officials will raise. You need to sort those red flags even before the handover or the tender date to the air, to the to the to the shipping line. And there are also compliant deadlines at the customs place as to when the material should arrive. Absolutely. It can't Absolutely. arrive at the last moment. Absolutely. And you have to pay for demerages if the if the material lies at the port, right? Lies at the port. And, and that's then, also a complex design thinking problem because you're losing money. Exactly. And not to forget our Indian ports are all chock a block. You yeah. talk Mundra, you talk Mumbai, you talk Vizag, you talk Chennai, they're all chock a block. Absolutely. Right. There's so many containers. So you need to factor in the the uh, timeline your container is going to take from the time it stands in the queue till the time it is offloaded. Once it is offloaded, then it works like clockwork. But if you don't plan it properly, the customer has given you all the goods on time. But if you don't take execute the uh, process, your container is probably be delayed and it's going to miss the shipping line. And then you are going to start turning it to skeleton saying, oh, let me put it on a barge or another small container and uh, ship, shipping line and move it to Colombo, which is a deep sea port. And from Colombo, let me ship it out. Or let me move it to Dubai or let me move it to Singapore. And then you're spending huge amounts of money, which the customer is not going to pay. Correct. Right. And it's, it's going from your, your margins. Or probably that transaction is going to be a loss making transaction. Who's failed here? is people people 
I think Dor, what Dr. Patil is commenting here is so correct. Fidelity is the main issue. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And I think human compliances, uh -huh. human competence, the human ability to solve challenging problems is a part of the DNA. I'm not saying it cannot be developed, but how many want to develop it? And therefore, if there is a process like design thinking, where the leader of the organization or even maybe the executor in the organization. Uh, a voice not audible, please check your bandwidth, please. I think we, we are able to hear each other very well. Uh, what is happening is that if people are not upgrading themselves or if people are not understanding the process well, the noise can set in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think a lot of times even lots of uh, shipments also becomes a very critical factor. Yes. Because somebody does some wrong entry somewhere or whatever happens, somebody does not monitor the whole process and the shipment goes to a wrong place. It does. It happens. And the reshipping it back is a huge cost. Yeah. And let me also share an experience, Niket. I mean, I, I shared an example of how things can go wrong. And then on the contrary, also let me talk about some positives. And this particular case is from Belgaum district itself. Where oh, the video is uh, did his education in Belgium, so he's <laughs> cool. we, both of us are quite Kannadigas in our own way. Yes, go yes. ahead. So there was this, there is this place near Belgaum called Hatarki, where there is this plant which is hugely uh, shipping to a lot of European and American aerospace companies and airline companies, the Boeing's, the Airbus, and so many others, the Bombardier. Now, this this company is called Aikis Private Limited. Right, and I was deeply in, engaged in the setting up this organization as a sales side of the country for for this international logistics company, and they were facing a huge amount of challenges in letting the goods reach on time. Uh, they, these are all aerospace materials, and they gave us a challenge saying, "Can you deliver this in Europe and US in 48 hours?" Now let's understand. There's a huge distance between Europe and US, so you can mm. reach Europe in 48 hours. 99.99% of the time, and they wanted a similar timeline for uh, delivery in the US as well. We said, let's try it. Give us a couple of trial shipments. And the earlier provider, the earlier service provider is to take all the big shipments from Belgium and take them all over their way to Bangalore. And from there, they used to ship it. So we said, no, we will not do it that way. We'll have a dedicated truck running from Belgium till, till to Mumbai. And it comes there early morning, six o'clock, and we had a freighter coming there at 11 o'clock in the morning and flying away at one. And we made such arrangements to make sure that it worked like clockwork. The transporter would leave from that place after eight o'clock customs clearance. He would be in Mumbai at six o'clock and we literally tracked him for two weeks in a row till the consistency and till the cycle was built. And we maintained that cadence and we made sure every time he came, the cargo was onto the flight and off it went. Europe was 48 hours, they said, yeah, Europe is off, skip, jump for you guys. What about US? And US, each and every shipment was delivered in 48 hours. Can you believe in those two weeks, we had signed a contract taking away all the export business and the air, air import, express import business for ACUS. And that was huge. That was a multi-million dollar transportation contract that we signed. So when you do a good job and when you have everybody in the value chain, uh, following the process given to them like clockwork, amazing things can be done. Certainly, certainly. And, I, and, and you take back in my time as a consultant, I was working with one of the companies doing design thinking project, similar thing. And we moved them from air freight to sea freight. Absolutely. Now for people here, you know, you to understand how this entire thing component works in a business value chain and supply chain put together, this is a transportation problem. Yeah, and in a transportation problem, it's a hardcore engineering company, which is doing very precision instruments, which have to be ensured that there's no damage and there are no shocks to it, a lot of things. So packaging is also extremely critical and important. The delivery times are extremely critical because it's a capital expenditure. And each order is in crores. Now, it's a high density, high volume cargo. Okay. Now, they were, if they were to ship that through air 
and then alternatively ship that through C. And if the average load of any component that is shipping is 100 kgs, could you tell folks here what is the cost saving of moving a high density, big volume cargo, each shipment 100 kgs from air freight to sea freight and we prototyped it in design thinking. What is normally the saving here? Per shipment. The, the cost of an air freight over a sea freight shipment back then in the days, maybe two years before the pandemic. Yeah. Two years before the pandemic. Yeah, before the pandemic was in the range of about 15 times. 15 times. 15 times. And so what now, is the average cost of a 100 kg high density, high volume cargo for a ship? Norm, uh, I don't hold you accountable for it. Yeah, it would be just a couple of cents, Niket. It would, it would be cheaper than moving a cargo from... In rupees, what would be a ballpark figure? A ballpark figure would be in the range of about 100, 115 rupees a kilo. 115 rupees a yeah. kilo? Yeah. And less, the than, less than uh, container load cargo. It's, it's a small cargo. It's a less than container load yes, cargo. Yes. It's, it's yeah, true. You're not booking the entire container. The same thing moving in air freight. What's going to happen? Right. Now? now, let me uh, split the air freight into two components. Okay. One is air freight, air freight, which is taken by the freighters primarily port to port. Uh, let's say if you were to move from Mumbai to Europe, uh, 100 kg cargo would cost anywhere up to 350 to 400 kilos and if i were to talk about 350 400 rupees per kilo yes and as it, against 115 rupees yes and then there are there are so many add-ons over it because there are transshipment costs there are handling and loading and loading costs i'm not talking that i'm talking only air freight yes right now so that, that, that that's a huge difference and then when you go and talk about from an express movement perspective uh the the cost would be in the range of 1100 to 1200 rupees a kilo where you get guaranteed delivery subject to customs clearance at origin and destination. Yeah. Got it. But now when you talk about it uh, in these times, the the gap has increased significantly because air freight has been moving, the express has been moving, sea freight has had several challenges with containers not being available, containers have choked up in various European and American destinations that's all moving from Asia Pacific to the Western world. The rotation, the turnaround time of a container, which used to be around 12 days, has gone up to about 45 to 60 days, which is okay. huge. So the supply of containers is very low. The demand for containers is very high. So the it's 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 a price sensitive product. Uh, if I don't have the infrastructure on hand, the price can really go up. And it's really choked up the supply chains big time. So we're dealing with a problem now that containers are not available. Therefore, everything is moving to air freight. Yeah. And because the demand of the air freight has gone up, obviously the cost of air freight has also gone up. Yes. Yeah. You know, I want all of you to realize in design thinking, when you talk about, when we talk about a prototype, we are not talking about always a physical prototype. Even the systems that they designed to move components from Belgium to Europe and US, and they tested it rapidly, is brought on a drawing board, created, and that process itself becomes a prototype for testing. That's the message principally that's coming out from what Satish is talking about. We talked about inbound, Satish. I think it's time to talk about outbound now. Yeah. More or less, unless there are inefficiencies in the organization, which also become a causation of design thinking problems, where if there are issues in operations, you know, for instance, we were just on a project together last week where we sorted that out for a company. Uh, the internal issues of the organization are obviously in the value chain, complete design thinking problems about human beings, you know, penalties being caused, they people not taking ownership to what they're doing. These are all problems which are design thinking problems. but Let's say a product is ready and has moved to dispatch. Dispatch to the end delivery. Again, we're looking at transportation only. What are the different problems and noises that can come because of which the customer experience can get compromised? Well, uh, the time at which the goods get ready for dispatch is critical. We need to understand how the transportation industry works from an international logistics perspective or even from a domestic perspective let's for example take domestic 
uh, the bells, the automotive bells that get manufactured in South India by a company called Fender India has to supply those bells for the engines uh, in Maruti. And Maruti does not keep stock more than a week. Every Friday night shift is over. They do not have any any belt available with them uh, for the Monday shift. So the over the weekend, of, uh, the company has to supply the bells to the warehouse of Maruti to be used and issued to the production on Sunday on Monday morning. Now that the bells don't reach, the one shift is gone wasted, uh, and there's a huge penalty that is being levied on the supplier for the delay. It's obvious because there are thousands of people sitting idle doing really nothing. So that's one of the pieces. At what time is your cargo getting ready? How are you booking space for the truck to move to the airport? And how are you loading? Are you catching the flight that is designated? So Blue Dart is one of the uh, only freighter operator in the country right now. SpiceJet is towing in this idea for the last two years. But Blue Dart is undisputed leader in this. If you do not catch the Blue Dart flight out of Bangalore or Chennai to get into Delhi, you have missed that day, that week's schedule. Uh, the whole of Monday's car penalty is going to be coming back. To that plant so it works like the just-in-time concept and that's what it's a complete clockwork right it is absolutely clockwork so absolutely the system clockwork. is designed yeah the process is designed but if the clock gets missed yeah the entire process goes for us yes and, let me and also... then that creates a complex problem yes because the shipments you can't just throw up your hands and say okay the customer is not going to get it correct now you have to start working on alternative mechanisms correct. Correct. and that becomes a design thinking problem correct Okay, so let's let's talk about it further. Yeah, so let me give you another example of uh, where I was involved. There was this uh, Volkswagen, which is the European automotive group com company, multiple companies in that group. Uh, they were falling. They had huge orders uh, from the group companies for the cars that they were selling, manufacturing and selling. They wanted AC vents, and those AC vents they were sourcing it from. India, because the European supplier, the cost was significantly different, very, very high. So the Indian supplier started upscaling his plan to fulfill the demands. Every two days they had a, they, they had a demand for 40 foot container to be shipped out and they were not keeping pace with that kind of manufacturing. So they had to take multiple options to reach to the customer's requirements. So every day or every alternate day, they would fly a guy from the logistics department with a 600 kg to 800 kg AC vents. These are all plastic components, those black rectangular or circular pieces that we see in the car cabin. They were supposed to be carried every day, every alternate day by hand. So there was a flight from Pune to Lufthansa. This guy would carry that every day with him, hand it over at the airport after for customs clearance, stay the night and travel back. And then there would be another guy traveling the following day. And they would be, they were barely able to make instead of three containers in a week, they would be able to make only one container in a week. So they had a huge amount of backlog. And then they called us and they said, can you help us tide over the situation? Fortunately for us, there was an Indian person who had taken up the logistics role in, in Germany and he wanted us to coordinate. So he said, fair enough, we can do that. If your person is moving three times in a week with a cargo of 800 kgs as personal baggage, which is costing him like 400, 500 rupees a kilo, we can save you on that cost. We can save you at least one third of that cost. You give us that cargo every day at this point in time. You give it to me at this time, you will customs clear the cargo at the dry port in Pune. So it's all customs cleared. The next day morning, freighter will carry it and the following day it will be delivered. So that takes care of your person having to travel, his hotel expenses, his absence in the plant is creating challenges yeah. for you. Yeah. All those things were uh, mitigated. We took a junior guy. We said, in this story, what you are now suggesting is that the process that the organization had created based on their past experience mm -hmm. was now creating a problem for them. So the process that's working is creating a problem. Yes. And therefore, it qualifies again as a design thinking design problem. Thinking problem. And okay, so when, you, for this. when you identify the root cause and you brainstorm with various people and you, like design thinking says, right, you fail early, fail cheap. Yeah. And go for the low hanging fruits, which are not having to make significant investment. That means you don't tell the company, let's buy an aircraft. Oh, no. <laughs> you don't. 
<laughs> that is the simplest solution, right? And that's not a wild solution. That's actually yeah. a stupid solution. Absolutely. Or you can even charter one instead of buying one. Yeah, or charter one. I mean, yeah. these are typically uh, solutions that would come up in a room, but these are not possible because then possible. you will erode your margins completely. Yeah. In fact, every deal will be a lost deal. Correct. And they needed this only for three months based on our assessment. In three months, the next plan, new plant was coming up and yeah. uh, the entire problem would go away. Or and they would be able to lie idle. Again. Yeah, sure. So for those three months, we said, this is how we will do it. You put your first load this time, give it to us, we will deliver it. Second load this time, we will deliver it the following day. And then the next day you send your person with 600 kilos of, or 800 kilos of container. So we mitigated all the overhead expenses that they were coming over with. And we said, if you stick to the production timelines and give it to us, whatever is ready, we can minimize the cost for you. And it is up to us. Customs cleared and delivered at your doorstep. Not too many people require. Otherwise, they had to carry a vehicle here from all the way to Pune airport, get it customs cleared, ship it out. They had to arrange for another truck at the airport in Germany to take it to their plant. We said, we will give it to you door to door. Just sit and relax and do what you do best. Manufacture AC vents. Let us do what we do best, clearing and delivering cargo. So, Satish, I'm sure a lot of faculties here would have a question and they haven't put it here, possibly. Yeah not to make us unhappy therefore they have not put this question here mm -hmm. why are engineers required for all this <laughs> by, the, by the by the way that engineers are trained to think okay to build a process to build a product and you can't build a product out of nowhere you got to have some process some method right it's a mad world out there in the corporate world everywhere you take you take procurement you take planning, you take production, you take packaging, you take dispatching. Everything is a mad world. Everybody is scrambling for time. Mm. Everybody is saying, if I had that additional six hours, I could do this. But that six hours is not Hardly. available. You don't even have 60 minutes. Forget mm. six hours. The method with which this madness can be controlled is ingrained in the engineers because of the four years of training, because of the practical exposure. So that you gave a lot of transportation stories. Mm -hmm. Are engineers required in this transportation story? They are, and we in the company that I worked for, uh, we there's a company, there's a department called industrial engineering, which mm -hmm. needs to be necessarily manned by engineers. So this was a freight forwarding company. This was an express, uh, express transportation company, far farther, I mean, speedier than air freight. So you're saying that logistics companies require engineers? We they do. They so do what do they do? I thought engineers were doing drawings, they were doing making products. What are they doing there? Okay, what they're doing is two things. One is in the engineering piece, they are coordinating with setting up the infrastructure that would be needed to eliminate human intervention and make automated stuff. So, for example, in U in US, in the state of uh, Louisville, Kentucky, there is a, a automated hub okay Can you imagine how big that hub could be that hub is as big as 40 football fields wow okay it has 120 miles of conveyor okay and in just under eight minutes a piece of car shipment can move from one end to the other end mm -hmm. and the cargo that comes into the u.s the entire night late afternoon and the night they start getting filled into 40 aircraft that are docked in the Louisville airport. Wow, okay. They move all the cargo into US for the next day early morning delivery. But this is a management problem. What are engineers no, it's doing? It's not a management problem. Yeah. Maintaining, designing, managing, building, uh, adding extra con conveyor loops is not any other job, it's an engineering. Which means we are also suggesting to the faculties here that design thinking opens them up even for jobs which conventionally academicians were looking at. Correct. It's no longer limited to manufacturing anymore. Correct. You Correct. can actually create students who can be given away to companies which are much more complex in their problem solving. True. The flows of the cargo, the way it is better handled, more efficiently handled, Reducing time, reducing damages, that's another way because damages is a liability on the carrier in case something gets law damaged over there. Uh, and of course, you lose face in front of the customer because you fail to handle it properly. That's where the engineers come in place. 
the second year ever engine has come in extremely handy and in a market like india is most of the exports that india does is 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 high tech uh, engineering goods automotive yeah. components yeah 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 when right. you talk you talk about the number of automotive com- companies in india and yeah. because they are all multi the ancillaries the number of ancillaries ancillaries yeah. yeah and and that's the very reason why niket india's small and medium enterprises export 45% of the revenue of the country mm they are not the large companies they are these the two small companies all put together the smes deliver more than 45% of the export revenue of the country mm. now if the smes are largely engineering companies who is going to better understand his need his pain and provide him a solution is an engineer because he is able Excellent. to relate to his product absolutely absolutely From sourcing to his packaging to his dispatch and meeting his customer requirements an engineer can relate to him very very well and the entrepreneur himself is an engineer yeah lot of entrepreneurs are actually engineers absolutely absolutely but i think in engineering we get conditioned to think in a highly analytical way primarily because of the course where that at least i went through mm-hmm. during my time mm-hmm. and therefore design thinking becomes an opportunity for an engineer to think out of that traditional approach and start solving a lot more complex problems with engineering being a base absolutely that takes us into the next conversation and then i'm going to let you go sure uh 3 pls and 4 pls uh okay so professor praveen is saying in engineering we have to set out out of box yeah yeah we have to we have to there's there's absolutely and i think engineers today in the world are equipped and have the fortunate opportunity of solving mega complex problems yeah i think that's where i mean in entrepreneurship whenever i teach entrepreneurship i say the bigger the problem the more the money you make if you're solving small problems you are earning small bucks if you are sorting out big problems you are getting big money and i think engineers must earn big money because they it's a grueling uh, academic session that they go through it's not very easy right yeah okay coming to this whole idea of now a lot of organizations which hire engineers and become outsourced parties to very big multinational corporations and suggest innovation solutions to them so we're talking about 3 pls and 4 pls yeah we'll also discuss with 7 pl okay so let's talk about the concept of a 3 pl third party logistics yeah 3 pl now 3 pl as when we teach supply chains we say 3 pls are typically freight forwarding companies which also have their in house innovation teams which solve problems for the customer and give them an innovative solution how would design thinking help them well look uh, like i said earlier you know uh, let each stakeholder in the supply chain who has who has a domain ex- domain expertise do his job for example as a freight forwarding or a transportation company domestic and international we can think through we can give very practical solutions plan a plan b kind of solutions to a customer who is into high tech product manufacturing or engineering product manufacturing let him do his job yeah Keep the rest to me similarly in 3 pl what happens is there are there are domain specialists who can value add ah, the- so there are domain specialists yes. in 3 pl yes and i think the domain specialists in 3 pl is where engineers also come in the true because each engineer is a domain expert in a particular domain in a particular domain all right right and the 3 pl 4 pl 6 pl 7 pl all of that is then adding your do, your specializations on board so yeah. for example in a 3 pl what we would do is, well, one co- company would do is they would take away all the logistics piece from the customer saying you give it to me this door this is your devices this is your equipment these are your contract people we will manage them absolutely these are your vendors so absolutely. we manage them as absolutely. you move in the higher in the higher the pl you are then saying okay i will take this piece i will get my vendor so what happens is because i have a big voice to negotiate with a vendor because i am a national let's say a 7 pl service provider yeah i have got tens of hundreds of contractors under with, with me for people for for uh, clerical jobs with it skills then i have got people with transportation background different kind size of vehicles they have 
they have got tie ups with multiple airlines so i say you manufacture give it to me here from here i take over i take it to my warehouse from there i move it your such erp pack system and my erp system with a plug in talk to one another yeah so what you see is what i see in real time what is ready i come and pick it up after i pick it up who is it shipped to when is it shipped to what is the uh, lorry receipt number or the airway bill number i know it and yeah. you can see it in your erp system as well so you don't chase me i don't chase you correct independently cut all the clutter cut all the human uh, intervention needed and we work seamlessly that helps the organization that's manufacturing because they are doing what they do best and their optimum production continues these guys do what is needed best in terms of meeting the customers obligations fulfilling the deliveries and getting back in case of any incompetencies or in inefficiencies that's how the world in logistics is moving today let me also tell you in in warehousing and distribution today most of the things are automated yeah it's in, it's the engineers oh, there are rfids there are there are the signals all over everything yeah. is being tracked in a warehouse yes yeah. now you look at the most complex of the region in the world which is the middle east the middle east has so many countries so many restrictions saudi arabia has their own laws qatar has their own laws kuwait has their own laws uae yeah. is a open economy now if dubai is giving a free trade zone for all your cargo to come in and not pay any duty unless it is consumed in the uae and you want to ship out of that rest of the goods to other parts in the middle east you can do it without having to pay duties how can we fulfill how can we put all the goods into the shelves and then retrieve at the earliest and fulfill anywhere the order orders are they are all being done by robotic machines today so then what does an engineer do there as a design thinker he is the one who designed the equipment because he knew this is a pain area as the volume increases on e-commerce it's not going to be humanly possible to be 100% accurate every time so let machines take over and machines once you feed a program and tell them what to be do what to be done no matter how monotonous it is they will do it without an error when it's a monotonous I job humans can make huge me. amount of problems I want to express to the faculties here. Sorry for cutting you short, but I think I want to transcend into the trans transcend into the next part. Mm -hmm. PPL still have their own interests in terms of managing a solution based on the services they offer. Yes. Therefore, now in the complex VUCA world that we live in, I'm anticipating a lot of four PLs to come in. Yeah. Four PLs do not have their own systems processes. They are absolute neutral parties mm -hmm. who have no interests. And they are now able to source the best of the people, yeah. the best of the services from the world, yeah. and create an innovative solution for the organization. True. Four PLs. I think engineers for four PLs, if we are creating, and by the way, these are not transportation guys. These are consulting houses, which yeah. could be camping outside from their office, the way we work, or they could be internal within the organization exclusively devoted to the organization to innovate the entire business value and the supply chains. Now, if this were the situation where you're not offering any service, but you are a completely a neutral party, and therefore you're absolutely fair in terms of the innovation that would, that would create, because 3PL may create an unfair solution. They're based on what they can offer, but 4PL offer solutions which are global solutions. Yeah. Absolutely neutral. Now, tell me, how would design thinking help in this kind of a situation? See, typically what we have seen, uh, or you and I have experienced when we do design thinking workshops in organizations is there are people there, they say, hey, this has worked like this for the last 10 years, 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Nothing's going to change. And that negative thought process, the negative mindset, or not looking outside the box for ideas. Yeah. Or just looking outside, but just barely, you know, very, very narrowly looking out just for the heck of it, does not really generate creative ideas for the organization. And that's where they get stuck in that in that situation. Sure. Being an outsider, and more often than not, he is he's an engineer with a management background with loads of experience behind his uh, uh, success. He comes and looks at things differently. He's not getting any past baggage. Getting baggage yes. So when yes. he started from a different perspective altogether, he sees so many ideas that can be improved and he during his engagement with the people during the initial survey days he's able to tell the organization these are some of the opportunities i see here 
which probably the employees within your company would have thought about it, but then they did not voice it, or they said, sure. this seems to be lame one, let's forget it. It, it may not work. It may not be bought over by my people. So just for the reason that it will be accepted or not, or uh, whether I'll be, I might feel humiliated, they don't come out with creative ideas. They don't come out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, yeah. true. You bring an outsider, like a four-peer consultant, they look at the different things, and they are able to offer a solution which works very well, well for the organization. I mean, just just a couple of weeks back when two of us were traveling to Ahmedabad, and we when 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 you said you go and take a look at the factory because you've already seen it, and work in the factory told me multiple opportunities where I could add value to that company. Yeah, but that's yeah. not the scope it's of not our activity. Domain expert, yeah. you are a domain expert. I'm a domain expert, and when we walk through the factory, we look at the factory with different senses. True. Our right. cognitions are different, yeah. and I think this whole diversity of experience then combines together to bring in a very different consulting project. True. You know what I'm saying and what I'm suggesting to the faculties here is the next important message I want to pass on. If colleges were to create such design thinking centers, interface with academicians, now we have engineering college professors who come from diverse streams and they are really masters on the topic. Somebody is a mechanical engineer, somebody is an electronics engineer, somebody is into computer science. If the college were to pull in all this talent together and were to offer a design thinking service and students are a part of the projects if they wish, not only are they creating employability, but they're also engaging with the industry. I think that's a fantastic model. What do you think? Absolutely, Niket. And um, to be honest with you, I was just thinking about what you were saying and how it can be magnified or taken across campuses to the industries that exist in the markets where the engineering colleges are based. Yeah. One of the one of the things that's expected by the students largely is if it is, it's an internship, it needs yeah. to be a paid internship. Yes. If somebody is offering a internship which is without being paid. They desist. They don't want to go there. Want yeah, which I believe needs to be uh, broken off, because if inst if industry has to accept so many new students from the market to give them projects, uh, let them look at their processes and suggest changes, the students will get a tremendous amount of experience when they are on the shop floor. Certainly, uh, and they can apply their classroom learning or lab learning into the real life situation. The amount of experience they will gain in those, let's say first year is build, building the basics, but in the next three years, if they're able to do at least one or two projects every year, can you believe the kind of experience they will carry and the industry with this experience? Oh, well, actually I'm, I'm thinking of a very different rationale behind all this. I'm saying internships are paid. Why can't design thinking centers provide the experience to the students, which is charged? And yeah. I think the power of design thinking and collectively people coming together and doing projects on design thinking is that you can charge. And that becomes a real time, real time experience for students for faculties and for the industry. So I think this whole 4PL model that you talked about also operates in design thinking and academicians and uh, industry can actually interface together. I'm going to end the session with 7PL. These are going to be companies which have, have their own aircrafts, they will have their own ships, and they're also 4PL innovators, the way the entire operations management of the company happens. Now it's no longer about supply chain or business value chain, but they are integrating both of this together. How do you think design thinkers and engineers in 7PL will actually prosper? This is a new industry that's opening up. Yeah. So when you look at today, uh, the sourcing coming in from the global market and uh, the company that I worked for is a sort of a 7PL itself. They have their own aircraft. Yeah. They lease aircraft. They're the ninth largest airline in the world. Yeah, they do not have the ships, but they they do provide sea freight solutions. They provide. In fact, I want to interestingly share here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think passenger aircraft carriers are smaller than the cargo aircraft they carriers. Are. Right? They are. Yes. They are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and then uh, they they move containers. They move air freight. They have got their own warehouses, which are automated warehouses. 
that company has software which can with a plugin connect with the ERP packages of customers. So they're giving them real time visibility. So you don't have to call and ask, where is my order? Where is my delivery and stuff like that? So the customer is independent of what is being done and a periodic text message or an email get sent out at different milestones uh, along the path of delivery. So the point is, this company today is managing vendors. For example, China is the is the factory for the world yeah. today, as much as we like it or not. A lot of companies are still sourcing it from China or when they were doing it when I was in this company, the company's salespeople would go to the customer and say, so what do you ship? What is your urgent? What is your not so urgent? What's it that can take 30 to 45 days to get delivered? They will scope the whole thing out and they'll give a one solution as two salespeople, one express person, one freight forwarding person, give all the solution. And you would go and say, sir, what is the inventory that is on the waters every time you ship a container? Yeah. And how many containers do you ship? What is the inventory carrying cost? How much of your working capital is blocked because of that? What is the interest you're paying on it? Yeah. That is impacting their profit. Yeah. So our guys would go and say, sir, if you move this cargo in this fashion and you use our warehouses in the US or Europe, this is how much bottom line impact and you had have. mbas and engineers in your team or what yes. kind of people were there yes engineers and mbas engineers and mbas and MBAs. so they were trained on a program called business people acumen who could think yeah <laughs> business acumen they would take very large companies the the first thing these guys would do is sit with a chartered accountant of within the company and yeah. analyze the balance sheet so they would not approach a customer without analyzing, analyzing the balance sheet. sheet. That means yeah. that the engineers were strong on operations, yeah. understand engineering, understand products, yeah. understands the entire process in which the plant operates. Correct. And then you have MBAs yeah. who are also doing checks on balance sheet, the profit and loss account, and combining this whole diversity of experience together Correct. Correct. and providing a solution. Yes. And they would say, this is the amount of money I can save you in your bottom line. Yeah. If you are in the red, you will be definitely at break even or positive in the next one or two years. If you are at break even or making profits, you will have more profits on, on in your balance sheet the next year around. If this is how you follow what we are trying to tell you, <laughs> and then the customer gives you trial movements for about two months, three months, having having proven that what you are saying is actually being delivered, the customer moves lock, stock, and barrel into you, and it's your baby. You manage it now. That's I think at the end, with. at the end point, I think the whole idea of bringing you here, Satish, on this conversation was PowerPoints are good. Yeah. I think there are some real experiences that also need to go to the faculties and to the students. And I think this is one of the ways, my dear faculties, you can invite industry folks who are into design thinking. And I have a bunch of mentors who are willing to work with you. These stories will be much more beneficial. Don't look at design thinking only as a credit system in the academic course. You are creating thinkers and the industry wants thinkers is the idea that we wanted to put across to you here in this 15 minutes conversation. Any last uh, inputs, gems that you want to drop before uh, we let you off? Yeah, like I was touching upon this point of uh... Internships which you give a different turn altogether, which is extremely possible and practically doable, is actually approaching the industry through the design thinking center of excellence, asking industries if they want aid and support from us to help them help them overcome the problem that they are facing. If you have to change gear, see doing the same thing and expecting different results doesn't work. Industries have to do different things. Institutions have to do things differently. They have to now get more creative because it's the time when india is already going to become the factory for the world yes india and is going to become the factory yeah, for the world and the demand for professionals will be on the rise yes and if we don't change our approach uh what's going to happen is we are going to have a lot of foreigners coming here and taking charge of what india can possibly do it at home so what it means is we're actually creating opportunities for the engineers and the management students and the pharmacy students, if, you, if, if, I, if I may add that segment as well, because healthcare, you, we've all known that has been holding the world uh, in, in good stead for the last two years in the pandemic and they're getting stronger. Pharma industry is extremely strong and BTU has a lot of pharmacy colleges. These are some of the streams that can really 
uh, contribute big time to making India the factory of the world. Yeah. The experience the students get on the plant, on the shop floor, in the market, they will shine like the gems. Thank Fantastic. You for the opportunity. Fantastic. 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 Thank you so much, Satish. There's a very interesting question, and then we will wind up the session here. Dear sir, where is the chance of appreciation of a great idea under design thinking process technique? Oh, you'd be surprised. Even as consultants, when we go and do a prototype which solves their problem completely, appreciation. In fact, if you go onto my website, you will find clients having given us letters on their corporate letters in terms of appreciation of the ideas. I think design thinkers are there for the future and appreciation is absolutely automatic. Price for the best idea, best prototype, very simple. What we do is we look at the benefit that will be derived from design thinking solution and we charge based on the benefit. We don't charge based on the time and the effort required to do the project. What is your profitability end of it? I want that to be shared. And that is the price for the best ideas. These are the views that we have. Thank you very much, Satish.